what do we do beyond the six? And I do believe that it's important for people to have interests uh, beyond work. And I think that's what makes life much more fulfilling. Uh, you have a vocation, but you need to have an avocation also. Uh, you mentioned quizzing. Uh, that's something that I've done now for what, last 30, 35 years. Uh, it's absolutely useless in terms of any economic benefit, but it's great because it makes you read. It gives you nuggets of information and it keeps your mind fresh. Apart from that, uh, I love teaching. I've been actually uh, taking one semester every year for the last 20 years in a management institute. Talked about travel. I think travel is, is really crucial because, uh, you know, if life is a mosaic of experiences, if life is a melange of experiences, travel enhances your memories, your experiences so much more. Uh, so I was fortunate in uh, while working also, I could travel to virtually every continent uh, from very well-known places like Hawaii to not so well-known places like the Iguazu Falls, uh, which is between Argentina and Brazil and so on and so forth. Uh, that is something that I would recommend to everybody. Uh, books, uh, yes, uh, as you can see it in the back, uh, books is, and we are, uh, you know, discussing books. But I think uh, today in today's world, the art of good book reading is lost and which is a pity because I think uh, there is nothing better than to be curled up with a good book. Uh, to my mind, a lovely book, an excellent book beats a good food, even good movies, though I love movies, good sex. So I think good books is something which uh, uh, we always encourage, I always encourage people to read. It could be anything that you like, fiction, non-fiction, whatever your tastes go. And uh, finally, I think all of us uh, have uh, tried to pick up something during this COVID thing. And uh, for me, it was something very unusual. I used to very proudly, and this is absolutely wrong in today's world, say that I can, in, as far as my cooking skills go, I can make toast in a, on a toaster. But uh, I started, uh, you know, experimenting with cooking uh, sometime in late March, and I've genuinely got to love it. And nowadays I try to cook a dish virtually every day. Initially, I thought it would be terrible. Then I realized it wasn't so. Uh, then I was uh, adventurous enough to ask uh, my neighbors to come. And they said it was good. I thought they were being polite. But when they asked me for the recipe, I thought it is not so bad. So I think it's really important to do things uh, beyond work. It also enhances your work. It's not the uh, you know old thing, oh, if he's doing a couple of things, how much time is he doing in work? I think it improves the productivity and it improves work itself. Uh, coming to the books. Uh, so, I, you know, there are, uh, as I think Ritu said, it's very difficult to choose one book. I did, uh, uh, I, I read Sapiens a couple of months back. I reread it. I bought that book sometime back. I, in fact, reread two books uh, this week. Uh, I'll start by giving a quotation from each of the two books I reread this week and then come to Sapiens because uh, I thought they were very interesting. And uh, the first one was a book by John Scully. John Scully was the CEO of Pepsi and then he moved to Apple uh, Computers. Uh, and he wrote a book from Pepsi to Apple. And he talks about the fact that Steve Jobs, who was the then CEO of Apple, was trying to woo Scully and invite him to Apple. And Scully was saying, yes, you know, uh, Apple at that time wasn't the Apple of today. And Scully was kind of thinking, etc. And, uh, you know, for him, it was a zero sum game. If Pepsi does well, Coke does badly. And he was thinking in terms of business and market share. One night, Steve Jobs called him and said, hey, John, do you want to sell colored water, which is Pepsi? Do you want to sell colored water for the rest of your life? Or do you want to work with me and change the world? And I think Scully says that hit me. And of course, he uh, left Pepsi, joined Apple, uh, you know, worked with Steve and did some insanely great things. But I wanted to focus on that quote because I have used that variations of that myself when I've wanted colleagues to join me by trying to show a higher purpose, you know, by saying that, look, there is much more that we can do. And that's why I love that uh, quote that, uh, you know, Steve's jobs gave to Scully. So that was the first one. The other book I reread this week uh, was uh, a book called English August by Upamanyu Chatterjee, a favorite of mine, but after many years, I just leafed through it and I was reading it. And uh, 
you know, again, there's a quotation, and this is on the last page. The hero of this book is a guy called Agastya Sen, called English August. And uh, he joined the civil services, he was confused, and he was finally said, look, this is possibly not for me. And when he was kind of leaving Madhana, where he was posted, he was reading another book. And this was a book by a, the, a Roman emperor called Marcus Aurelius. And Marcus Aurelius wrote a book called Meditations, uh, which is really sayings to himself when he was fighting these wars with the barbarians. And Marcus says that today I have got my perplexities out of myself. I have actually got myself out of my perplexities for they lay within, they lay in my outlook. What it means is that we all, we sometimes feel confused, we sometimes get perplexed, we sometimes don't know what to do. But a lot of the time, it is in our thoughts, in our outlooks, if we can kind of understand, you know, that which is making us confused internally, you can get a solution. And I've used this myself. Sometimes you want to curse the world, you want to curse the company, you want to curse your bosses, you want to curse your colleagues, you want to curse your subordinates. But a lot of time, the perplexity, the complexity is in your, is within, it's in your outlook, it's in your thought. And if you can kind of try to understand that, you will arrive at answers. And I have done that myself. So this quotation is not just a quotation in itself, but a quotation I've used myself by saying, hey, if you are perplexed, if you are confused, if you are worried, understand it from within, understand it from your outlook and see if you can find ways out. Uh, again, a great book. The book is uh, very interesting, but I just wanted to quote uh, this uh, uh, quotation from this book. Uh, the book that, I, that I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk a little more about is Sapiens by Harari, a very well-known book. Uh, I think the subtitle of the book, the book is here. Uh, the subtitle of the book is A Brief History of Mankind. It talks about mankind from really uh, the Stone Age to the 21st century. He makes a lot of interesting arguments, many of them provocative, some of them one may not agree with. But I'm just going to, in the interest of time, speak about just three, four of them. And one of his main theses is this. By sapiens, he talks about homo sapiens, that means he talks about us. He says that we rule the world because we are the only kind of people who've been able to believe things that don't exist in real life. What does he mean? He talks about things like religion. He talks about things like myths. He talks about fantasies. He talks about nation state. Because you believe in them, you are able to fight for them. You are able to defend them. You are able to work with others in order to achieve your objectives. The wars of religion or the defense of religion has gone for thousands of years. But religion is not something that you can see, feel and touch. The nation state. A nation is an artificial line. I mean, somebody in, 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 in UK drew a line and said, oh, this is India and this is some, some other place, right? But, so it is an artificial thing, but you will fight for your nation. You will try to defend your nation. So that's, that's his thesis, that's his primary thesis. By saying human beings have been successful, they cooperate. They work together to achieve objectives and goals and they work together for things which are really imaginary in inverted commas because you can't see it, you can't feel it, but you will fight for it. You will give your life for it, you will defend it, you will achieve it and you will succeed and so on and so forth. And this whole concept of nation state is not just that you go to war with nations, but when India plays cricket, it's all the people who say we are part of India get together to, uh, to, you know, to kind of to celebrate India's victory or to mourn India's defeat as the case may be. That's his second, th I mean, again, I'm just giving three, four theses that I remember. I mean, there are many. The second one is he talks about the agriculture revolution. So basically, he says there are three revolutions. One is the cognitive revolution, uh, revolution where human beings could imagine language and all that. The agriculture revolution is, of course, where human beings could actually grow plants and domesticate animals and move from being a hunter gatherer to be uh, to lead a settled life. His thesis, of course, is very interesting. He says, while this happened, he says human beings were not better off. He says the normal farmer had more drudgery than he had hundreds of thousands of years ago when he was a hunter-gatherer. Yes, there were people who did well, 
who were the elite who exploited the surplus that these farmers could produce. But the farmer's life was not better off. And to use his own words, I think he calls the agriculture revolution one of the biggest frauds in history. That's another point. The other point he talks about, for example, is uh, he raises another interesting topic. And he says, look, in 1600 or 1700, it was India and China which would dominate the world economically. I think the GDPs of India and China were more than 30 to 40 percent of the world. What happened in the last 100, 200 years? You know, China has, of course, now become a more dominant. But if you look at the 1970s, India and China would be less than 4 percent of the world's GDP. So what happened in the last 200 years? You know, because by 1600, India and China were richer than the other countries. And technologically also, it was almost the same. Gunpowder, everybody could use. You know, uh, there were there were inventions in all these countries. And he says the whole reason happened and the Industrial Revolution took place in the West is when these people went and went to new countries. First of all, they said they went to new countries. Nobody from India, the Mughals uh, didn't say that let's go and uh, colonize America or the Chinese did not say let's go to Africa or let's even go to Australia. But it's the British, for example, who went to all these places or the, or the Spanish. And he says, but when they went, it was of course to conquer, but it was also to explore. It was also to understand. It was also to understand science and geography and botany and geology. So, for example, when Captain Cook, uh, he goes around the world tour, he gets 150 scientists and botanists and, uh, you know, geologists with him to understand, you know, the whole world. Uh, when HMS Beagle goes to the Galapagos and goes to uh, South America, it takes with them one Charles Darwin who, of course, brings with him thousands of species and then writes that famous book called The Origin of Species. In fact, when Napoleon uh, went to, to Egypt, uh, he did an expedition to conquer Egypt. On that ship, apart from guns and soldiers, there were 150 scientists, you know, trying to understand. Let's try to understand. So he says that it is this thing. It is not just to conquer or not just to colonize, but to explore, but science, to understand whether it is animals or rocks or physics or chemistry, etc., which gave that edge to the West and which is why today he says, while we, while there are all civilizations, but a lot of things that we do, a lot of things that we speak come from Western civilization. It's all not gloom. So, for example, he, 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 say, he talks about war and he says, look, one of the things which, uh, which uh, hap happens today is that the war, war is less likely today. War is less likely today. Uh, than it is, for example, uh, years back. I mean, if you look at uh, the early centuries and you look at the Middle Ages and you look right till 1948, the Second World War, uh, war was very, very common. And the reason he says that it is not so common now, he says one is that the pains of war are high, the dangers of war are high with everybody having an atom bomb. But more important, he says that the gains from war are not so high. Earlier, you did war because you wanted to conquer territories and you wanted to get, say, access to gold or minerals. Today, Google is worth more than 50 countries. And he gives a specific example of California. And he says, look, if you wanted to conquer California earlier, you would have conquered California for the land and from the gold. You know, California had the famous gold rush. But today, the real wealth of California is in Silicon Valley. It's in the minds of people who work in a Google or a Facebook or a micro, you know, all of that. And therefore, he says the gains from war are not there because today a Google is worth 20, 30 countries. So therefore, he says that the chances of war are much lesser uh, than they can be before. Uh, and and I'll, I'll end with one more. I could have spoken on and on, but I'm conscious that there are other people and you know that you need to hear. Uh, he talks about at the end, the whole globalization and that we all agree. Uh, you know, he talks about uh, obviously there is a global uh, capitalism, global markets, global warming, but he gives a, he gives an interesting facet on global culture, and he says all culture is global. You know, we we try to talk, talk about ethnic culture, but he says, look, the culture of India was influenced by all the people who came to India, whether the Persians, the Afghans, the Arabs, the Mughals, and so on and so forth. So he says there is it's a composite culture, and he gives a very specific example. He says some of his some people tell no 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 there is a culture in food, ethnic food you know, spaghetti and tomatoes or chilies in India. And the interesting part is that the both the tomatoes and chilies are not native to India or to Spain, uh, you know, or to Italy. I beg your pardon. They, they, uh, both the both chilies and tomatoes actually are native to Mexico. 
so he says that look even when you're talking about ethnic culture those uh, products have come from different parts of the world they've not uh, come uh, from those countries itself so he says now it's a it's it's really a global culture it is really a, a, a global world so the book is very interesting the book is extremely provocative the book has a lot of theses i've just given three four of them there are multiple some you may agree some you will not agree but it does uh, make you think it does make you wonder and it does make you uh, figure out about what's going to happen and he concludes by saying look today you know it's 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 you know we talked about man and we talked about how man uh, triumphed over other animals how man triumphed over the neanderthal but today it's the bionic man it could be the superhuman man which could take over and he's written a new a new book called homo due which talks about that so a fascinating book lot of fascinating constructs uh, for business uh, from 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 this book uh, that i think all of us should read